Greetings and welcome back to our investigation on the legitimacy of the idiom, the customer is always right. Today we'll be looking more into some of the philosophy and ethics, but also delving into the practicality and real world implications of putting the customer first. If they, you know, are even your customer in the first place at all. Additionally, I want to address some of the concerns regarding racism in various industries, of how claims of racism can impact a business, and if there is any basis in reality for companies that engage in what is commonly depicted by media outlets and those quick to be offended as vile discrimination when in reality, it may actually just be logical pragmatism. So, first, to recap what we discussed last time, Tom Sorrell notes three general instances in which the customer is, in fact, wrong. The first is that the customer is wrong if his or her requests or demands will ultimately lead to business failure or reduced profitability. Businesses often shoot themselves in the foot by simply being too accommodating. For example, after UK Junior Health Minister Edwina Curie suggested that eggs were the primary origin of salmonella in the late 1980s, egg production plummeted across the region, with an industry loss of 70 million pounds between the years of 1988 and 1989. Meanwhile, the rates of salmonella poisoning remained more or less static despite the fact that people weren't eating eggs anymore, indicating that despite any good meaning on the part of Eguina, the fear instilled by that meaning and that message into the British people exploded, regardless of estimates that the chance of coming into contact with the salmonella bacteria at the time from an egg was 1 in 200 million. Yet all of a sudden, the customer had become knowledgeable and convinced of this knowledge that eggs were the massive cause of salmonella and that their lives were in danger by having eggs with their morning toast. And beans and mushrooms and tomatoes and sausage and pudding and oh god, I'm already hungry. The point is, the truth no longer mattered. The customers had been informed. That's probably also why the Scottish microwave their eggs. Hmm, explaining a lot now, isn't it? Listen, for my scrambled eggs are fucking delicious. You sheep shagging degenerate fish retard. But alas, Eguina resigned her position as health minister shortly thereafter this came out, having essentially made an entire nation of customers wrong when it concerned eggs. Sorrell's second point is that customer satisfaction may be dependent on alteration to an individual's art or craft, but that the moral obligation to change one's work for a patron is highly based upon context and moral or ethical code, or, I don't know, maybe how hungry you are. It seems, though, from Sorrell's argument that a burger flipper is more obligated than an executive chef or renowned artist to change the product he's producing. It had, like, ham in it. <laughs> oh, it's, no. it's closer, oh, no. it's closer to a British carbonara. <gasps> oh no. It is, no that's true. Oh well, that's well, fine, I'm glad you're standing yeah. there. Do you agree? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what I mean? If my grandmother had wheels, she would have been a bike. <laughs> you know, what, you know, it's... <laughs> You know, what time is, you know, it doesn't make any sense what you said, it's a different recipe, it's got nothing to do with the uh, macaroni cheese. Finally, Sorrell argues that the customer may be wrong when his or her demands result in negligence or in injustice. Sorrell argues that it is immoral to provide services which lead towards such an outcome. However, I find that claim a bit spurious and difficult to isolate logically. What I mean by this is that sometimes it's difficult to separate morality and ethics from the bottom line. And long-term detrimental effects are sometimes, in that instance, subjective in nature. If you're more worried about the morality and ethics of your company, well, then maybe along with that will come financial success. Look at Chick-fil-A, for example. In 2014, the average sales per restaurant of a Chick-fil-A was 3.1 million. Compare that to KFC at less than 1 million per restaurant, 960,000, and to McDonald's at 2.5 million per restaurant. In terms of total company sales, Chick-fil-A brings in, at least according to the 2014 data, $5.8 billion a year. That makes them the eighth largest fast food chain in the US at least by profits, but not by number of stores or size. They have less than 2,000 restaurants, and none of them are open on Sundays. Compare that to McDonald's, which has 14,000 restaurants in the United States. 
Chick-fil-A refuses to sacrifice some of their morals, such as being open on Sunday, and yet they have massive financial success. But oftentimes, these things need to be balanced. What's worse in the grand scheme of things, friends? The fact that Papa John's individual franchise owners are reporting between a 5 and 20% decrease in profits, as Stifle analyst Chris O'Cool estimates, with an annual cash flow decrease to $60,000 in 2018 from $95,000 in 2016, which in and of itself potentially leads to the termination of employees and the closing of entire restaurant locations. What's worse, that or someone saying a dang word that might hurt some feelings of people who almost certainly enjoy the rap music in which said word is used every other sentence? Which is more morally and financially bankrupt? I'll give you a second to figure it out, although I think the numbers should paint a fairly clear picture. But we are talking ethics again, so I'm asking you, friends. What's worse? Sacrificing your integrity or sacrificing your profits? Or in the case of Papa John's, looks like both. I suppose we could also look to the massive loss in profits suffered from another company with a public figure very much on the other side of the worst thing you can be and or do scale. Although, let's be real, that old nursery rhyme of sticks and stones can break my bones but child rapists get the rope uh, should ring true here. And by that, I'm talking about the affiliation between Subway and Jared Fogel. Despite disassociating with Fogel immediately after information regarding his vast collection of child pornography and generally highly questionable behavior became public, stocks in Subway have continued to plummet for the last few years. Now, you could say part of this is Jared's fault, but it's not all Jared's fault. I don't think that kind of direct causal relationship can be established as the company over this same period of time has also caught flack for, for example, having their chicken rated as containing less than 40%, you know, actual bird meat, instead containing predominantly soy protein. Because, of course it does. And hey, you know, despite the soy boy meme, I actually don't hate tofu. I quite like it in its own, in a nice Thai green curry. But I certainly do mind it when I'm trying to enjoy a chicken salad that's not, well, chicken. Further, if you haven't been to a subway in the last half a decade, you might not have noticed that when we talk about appealing to your customer base with the slogan of eat fresh, I can't think of many people who value the idea of freshness that would turn immediately to spubby for their daily meal. Not considering that most of their ingredients are stale, processed garbage. Regardless of which aspect and variable played the most influential role, although not impossible to find out through some more in-depth customer research, Subway has been forced to close hundreds of locations over the past few years, and their stock is in the toilet, particularly compared to many of their competitors. I'm in no way saying Subway should have in some way maintained their business relationship with Jared Fogel, but rather that only distancing themselves at that point had little to no impact on the business in a positive manner because, well, when dealing with a pedophile, you're talking about meeting expectations of behavior rather than exceeding them. By that I mean, of course you fire the fucking pedophile. Of course you do. Now, I guess you could change that around on me and say, well, of course you fire the guy who says the N-word. Of course you do. But I'm sorry, I just think they're kind of different things. And maybe we're getting back into that ethics question already. It's going to be a big, big topic when we get into some of the Holly weird shit here. But I think we have to consider the ramifications of actions. Who was hurt by what John Schneider said versus what Jared Fogel essentially did in his possession of that material? Just something to keep in mind. But looking further, Iacobucci, Grayson, and Ostrom, 1994, identified a number of fables associated with the concept of customer service that we should look at. And given the similar publication date as Sorrell's piece, let's take a little gander at their criticisms of the notion of the importance of customer service based on a comparison between the core of the service, that is, what you're actually paying for, and the frills that come along with it, those accoutrements that we view as positive surprises rather than, again, necessary expectations that need to be met. Going back to a field I feel a bit more comfortable in, we might call this a positive expectancy violation. But the researchers in this study refer to it as the gap model, which posits that consumers desire their experiences with a business to exceed that which they anticipate. In other words, going the extra mile in service. 
It may be, then, the researchers argue, that particularly with utilitarian purchases, the core of the product outweighs any potential trappings that come bundled together with it. Further, they suggest that given about 50% of product failure is on the side of the customer, the entire concept that the customer is always right is inherently absurd, as most customers are boomer dummies who don't know how to read instructions. Yakobuchi et al. also questioned the cost-benefit ratio of appealing to customers first and foremost with frills and placations that serve more as indicators of customer care than actually being representative of the core product that you're providing. For example, you may get more customers on your doorstep if you announce that you're holding a raffle for a bitching Lambo at your car dealership, but most of those customers are just in it for the prize and will likely only stay long enough to enter and exit, footing you as the owner with the bill for the bitching Lambo. These are not loyal customers, and the prize is unlikely to make them become as such. Similar is the concept of segmentation, in that some segments of the population are just unlikely to be attracted to your product or company, and while you want to reach as many potential customers as possible, shouting into the void is shouting into the void. It is pointless. <laughs> as I said in the last video, Twitter activists don't eat Papa John's pizza on a weekly basis, just like they don't eat Burger King ma imaginary pink tax chicken fries. Introducing chicken fries for a buck 69 and chick fries. It's the same chicken fries you love, but for way more, because girls like pink. The wage gap is simply the average earnings of men and women working full time. It does not count for different job positions, hours worked, or different jobs. It has nothing to do with the same jobs, it has nothing to do with discrimination. And never will, until you start making exclusive $100 a serving cauliflower tofu blend 100% organic, certified vegan, rainforest friendly, veggie frites with umami demi glaze. Available only in LA, Portland, and New York City in food trucks, the locations of which are tweeted out and then immediately deleted 30 minutes later to ensure maximum exclusivity because I'm literally a communist. <laughs> and I literally can't tolerate anything that doesn't meet those standards. Ew, meat. By the way, meat is murder. <laughs> oh my god, I'm literally shaking right now. To pander to said demographic is pointless. This is the kind of person who buys Burger King chicken fries. Me! That's who! But the exact same thing applies to Papa John's and to this ridiculous pink tax thing. Pizza is the all-American food. It's not aimed at these yuppies. Pizza is the all-American food because even when it's all fucked up, we still love it. When it comes to low investment purchases like pizza and chicken fries, people care about the bottom line and the product, not about the lifestyle and the image. In terms of the little extras, the frills, yeah, they can matter, particularly, as the authors suggest, in the case of industries with few product differences. That's not the case in the food industry, though, and by that I mean this. When I ask you, hey friend, what's your favorite fast food joint? I'm sure you have an answer in your head. And sure, there will be a lot of the same answers from you in the crowd. But for the most part, everyone kind of has a unique taste, a rationale, or a favorite menu item that makes McDonald's their go-to for the Beatus over Burger King, or Wendy's, or Carl's Jr., or In-N-Out, or what have you. The core products are significantly different enough, despite being in the same industry. Look no further than the unending battle between products as seemingly similar and indistinguishable to an outside observer as Coke and Pepsi. And by the way, the answer is RC Cola. Fight me IRL on this. Yeah, I bet each one of you has a favorite soda pop, but which team of plastic industrial tubing are you into, hmm? Come on, which PVC manufacturer really gets you going? Supplemental frills may be particularly attractive to the layperson who knows less about plastic industrial tubing than even I do, and I don't know dick. But for concerns of what to have for dinner, everyone can make up their minds on that pretty easily. You don't have to be a rocket surgeon. The fastest way to get money is to steal a bank machine. It doesn't take rocket appliances to realize all you gotta do is take a fucking chain, hook it up to a truck, and yank the fucking bank machine out of the store. 
As such, it's not a matter of supplements or frills, but often of brand loyalty and preference. And yes, some people will never want to eat your greasy slop, no matter how many people rate it the best pizza in Denver. Honestly, the best pizza in Denver? I mean, does that look like the best pizza? Trust me, I can tell you, it doesn't taste good. And on that last note, similarly, Iacobucci et al. described the insipid and naive nature of service guarantees. To say satisfaction is guaranteed is ridiculous, as inevitably, someone will not be satisfied with your service for some reason or another. Likely, often, a reason that is completely outside of any controllable variable under the influence of any given business. Some people are just in a shitty mood, and some people just act shittily all the time. That's their nature. What the dick is your problem? As such, the researchers conclude that long-term focus on brand identity and the quality of one's product is more likely to result in the successful operation of a business over time than any superficial emphasis on pleasing all the people all the time and in potentially wasting money and resources on superficial incentives that will likely not attract loyal customers and people who will stick around with you, and may in fact overwhelmingly misjudge their target markets. While uniqueness, luxury, and personalized service may be desirable in some industries, expensive cars, fancy watches, and jewelry, and so on, when it comes to things like chain stores and restaurants, it's likely that, in contrast, standardization and simplification is actually preferable, not just for employees where you see higher turnover, but for customers as well. As, for example, a person with a very high sensitivity to certain foods may know that, say, Papa John's is something that doesn't bother their stomach. My stepmom is precisely that way when it comes to food. So when we're traveling, we know that we can go out somewhere to eat that's novel and she will have to bring along her own peanut butter sandwich in a little baggie, or we can stay in and order from a local Papa John's, knowing that neither of them will result in her having to take a trip to the hospital. And I know someone's gonna make a comment about it, so before you do, she just knows that Papa John's doesn't bother her. It doesn't matter if it's necessarily reasonable or logical. She knows what Papa John's tastes like and is okay with Papa John's pretty much everywhere. That's a real story, by the way, guys. Uh, I'm not even just substituting Papa John's there. That's legit. Now, very quickly, Friedman, 1998, also did add a bit of a response to Sorel's initial criticism of the customer as king model, but he didn't really dispute it. He only suggested that it's not so much that the customer is not always right, but that every aspect of the system is capable of making error. Wow, what awesome insight. <laughs> Sorry, don't mean to be diminutive. I am including it for a reason. He goes on to say that often what may appear malicious, though, on the part of a consumer is, in fact, merely an accident. He is more or less Hanlon's razoring it, in that do not attribute to malice that which is equally or more adequately explained by stupidity. But we need be honest. A lot of what is happening with the social media outrage is not an accident. It is absolutely on purpose. They are campaigns, and it is why bowing down to commands and demands when it regards customer service is often short-sighted. You want some evidence? Well, Starbucks now serves as a glowing emblem of why you don't allow public outcry to alter your business practices. Given not only have employees been forced to honor fake coupons or demands for free drinks, they've been generally mistreated, harassed, and attacked. They've had their places of employee transformed into homeless shelters, all to appeal and appease to the Twitter mob, while Starbucks as an overall company's stock value has plummeted by 12% shortly following the temporary closing that they held of 8,000 stores for re-education. I, I, I mean, diversity training. And by the way, if you go and look what employees had to say about their day of remembrance of racism, customers were pretty pissed off that they couldn't get their lattes that morning. Not looking like it's so far so good, Justin. What we can see here for Starbucks and Papa John's then, is it? Let's look a little bit more though at some historical and practical examples to provide us with some more context though. Xiao Rolf, 2014, in an article for Huffington Post of all freaking things, raised five reasons for why the customer is not only not right, but outright wrong, beginning with an anecdote from Herb Keller. 
former CEO of Southwest Airlines, in remembering a particular repeat customer of the airline who complained without fail after every flight of her disgust with the service and demanded the company accommodate her over and over in a revolving series of issues that occurred after each and every flight she took. After numerous attempts to appease this woman, the customer service department sent one of her letters up the pipeline to Keller, who responded by saying, and I'm paraphrasing just a little bit here, thanks, but bye bye and we'll miss you, while casting level 12, be gone thought. BE GONE THOUGHT! My guess, given that the thought was gone afterwards, that she found another airline to bother as she stopped writing Southwest. But hey, What's worse, again, an empty seat or a filled one that you end up having to comp over and over again because the lady sitting her butt in it knew she could game the system that runs under the customer as king paradigm, the very way that Sorrel described. Secondly, Kshorov states that an overemphasis on customer satisfaction makes employees simply unhappy when the needs of the customer are always placed first, and we've certainly seen plenty of evidence of that of late. But it's in no way a new phenomenon. Gordon Bethune, former CEO of Continental Airlines, said of employee customer balance that, quote, when it's a choice between supporting employees who work with you every day and make your product what it is, or some irate jerk who demands a free ticket to Paris because you ran out of peanuts, whose side are you going to be on? You can't treat your employees like serfs. You have to value them. And Bethune appears to have some clue of what the heck he's talking about, given that under his leadership, Continental's stock rose from $2 a share to a whopping 50 buckaroonies a share, and the company was named among the top 100 places to work for six years running under his flag. Of course, as I've said, we have plenty of more recent examples as well, and we'll be getting into some of the more empirical information on customer slash employee satisfaction in more detail as we go forward. But for now, consider briefly the current state of Starbucks, where employees have come out of the woodwork to complain about how the company essentially gave carte blanche approval to turn their places of employ into halfway homes and their employees into laughing stocks forced to honor coupons made by four channers to prove how totally not racist they are. Coupons with a QR code that, by the way, just outputs to the word <gasps> maker, funnily enough. As usual, good job, poll. If we're presented with one of these fake coupons, uh, to just go ahead and honor it and try to avoid any type of future, you know, situation. Yesterday, uh, one of my partners received a phone call from a guy uh, saying that he and his uh, squad um, were, were on their way to my location to, uh, for their free coffee um, and that they would be recording the entire thing uh, so that they could put it on World Star uh, or social media or YouTube or, or Facebook or wherever, and proceeded to call her a uh, white bitch. And that leads us back, though, to our third point, being that acting as if the customer is always right allows for certain Machiavellian, if you want to call them that, and I'm going to, customers to abuse companies and employees alike to maximize their personal benefits without concern or loyalty to the company that they're essentially scamming. This is perfectly illustrated by the recent Starbucks outrage, and even more recently in this video that received some minor viral attention, which depicts a CVS employee literally shaking calling the police after an altercation with a customer, Camilla Hudson, which conveniently the altercation in and of itself was not filmed after she tried to use a coupon at the store. And then, again, this guy called the cops on her. The man, Maury Maston, thought that the coupon was a scam and asked her to leave. But of course, in response, she accused him of being, what else, a racist. Since the video was posted on reputable news outlets like The Root, which uh, similarly castigated Maston for having the audacity to report Hudson to the cops as an African-American woman when she preferred the term black as proof of his racism. <laughs> wait, yeah, wait, wait, hang on, wait, what? What? I, I thought African-American was the politically correct term? Wait, they're, they're, they're calling him racist because he called her African-American, not black. Hold the phone. 
Hang on. Anyway, since then, Mastin and another manager at the store were terminated by CVS, which has made a big public apology to Hudson and the entire black community. Oh, we're so sorry for our rampant racism. But was that a wise decision on their part? Or a shitty customer taking unfair advantage of the current indescribable fear that every corporation has of being labeled racist? Well, Mastin is a conservative and a white man. That's strong enough evidence for most people that Hudson's claim she was racially profiled is accurate, right? Maybe. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's metaphysically absurd. I can't get inside the guy's head. But Mastin is also a gay boy and the leader of the local log cabin Republicans chapter, which advocates for LGBTQ rights and issues within the Republican Party. So it's probably safe to say he's not a particularly discriminatory guy. Gay? Fuck. At least when it comes to the guys. Gays. Shit. But luckily for us, we don't even have to speculate. We don't have to try and get inside his head to see how warped this situation was in reality. The police recordings show that Mastin's call had nothing to do with the coupon that Hudson presented him with, but rather because Hudson was reportedly yelling obscenities, following him around the store, including into the employee-only back room, disrupting other customers, and refusing to leave after being asked. 6150 North Broadway at CVS. A few outside location harassing customers and clerk making threats, nothing further. They're calling back at 6150 North Broadway. Santino, black, green shirt, white dress. Kabila Hudson, she's inside the store. Threatening staff and refusing to leave. She can be heard in the background, nothing further. Which means not only was she disturbing the peace, but by remaining on the premises, trespassing. Oh, where have I heard that before? You don't even have to take Mastin's word on the call with the cops for it. Another customer, Markeisha Jordan, doesn't sound like a white woman, I could be wrong, but just saying, reported witnessing the incident and described Hudson as yelling at Mastin, following him into the employee-only area and making her personally feel uncomfortable. But all that harsh, totally not racist reality aside, let's address the coupon situation itself, because that's the real emblem of the unfair customer advantage. Coupons. Where do I get a coupon? You see that line over there? It takes forever. I stood in that line for an hour. I got to show them a driver's license, birth certificate, fill out a form. They mail that away. Send me back some coupons. By CVS's own company standards, quote, we have the right to refuse or limit the use of any coupon and or the subsequent return for any reason at the discretion of CVS pharmacy management. This is the very policy that CVS subsequently fired two managers for adhering to. So what was this enigmatic coupon? Well, this is it. Needless to say, it looks a bit suspect, bit fishy, huh? It requires no proof of purchase. It's not buy one, get one free. It's just free shit. It has the word CVS stamped onto it hastily with no logo. No specific products or things need be purchased are mentioned. It's just general CVS stuff. It doesn't have anything pictured and it has a maximum value of free, absolutely free products of up to $18. Yeah. A little bit suspicious to say the least. By CVS's own company standards, this is not an acceptable coupon given it does not say it can be redeemed at CVS, but merely includes the store's name in print, not the manufacturer's name, and possesses no CVS logo. Something, you know, it takes like five seconds to do in MS Paint, I'd point out. How lazy are you? Thus, considering the coupon is for incontinence products, you could not only describe the quality of it as crap, but Hudson and her claims of racism as full of shit. But I should be clear, a company, First Quality Retail, has confirmed the authenticity of this coupon. But considering other couponeers agree that it looks sketchy and weird, can you really blame Mastin, who works for a store that is frequently scanned by fake coupon users, for not buying this amateurish looking turd at face value? I mean, I'll bring this up again later, but drugstores have the highest frequency, or drug-related products, of shoplifting and theft. 
hang on, Aiden, isn't it still possible that Mastin really just is a racist who unfairly misjudged Hudson's crap on before giving it a more thorough inspection or benefit of the doubt? Of course it is. And there's even some precedence in anticipation of racially influenced biases on the part of organization and employees associated with CVS we can look at. By that I mean this is far from the first time CVS has caught some flack in the public for supposed racial profiling. In 2015, four former employees of the company filed a class action lawsuit against it, claiming that a store loss prevention supervisor directly instructed them to actively engage in racial profiling against black and Hispanic customers, with their claims that the supervisor made frequent statements such as, quote, black people always are the thieves, and that, quote, lots of Hispanic people steal, and to, quote, watch the black and Hispanic people to catch more cases. Now, the fact that there has been no media updates about this case over the last three years leads me to believe it probably is rotting in legal hell if it hasn't just been dismissed, considering, well, you're never going to be able to prove that shit if you don't have a recording, but even if you could, <laughs> well, hang on, let's wait a minute before addressing that point. CVS was also under scrutiny from the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC, under charges of discrimination up until June 6th of 2018 for, um, giving prospective employees personality tests, which the EEOC claimed, in more indirect language than I'll use here, adversely affected brown people. Yeah, that's right, the US government, in an attempt to display how totes not racist they are, admitted that people of different races, on average, respond differently to personality test instruments. You heard it here first, folks. The EEOC are race realists. I mean, you wouldn't want to hire people who are based on personality profile trends less likely to engage in larceny on average, now would you? That would just be silly. I'm not even talking about race, I'm talking about personological differences. Yeah, particularly you don't want to do that given that employee theft, while on the downward trend over time, typically rivals, if not supersedes shoplifting as the most major loss in inventory. Now, no, 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 no. We wouldn't want to screen our employees or anything, as is, you know, par for the chorus in almost every single goddamn industry, if not every industry that exists. Of course, you screen your employees. But, well, if you're looking at it from the other side, that's just evidence that CVS really does have a problem with racist practices, isn't it? They've been investigated by the EEOC. They were sued for racism. Maybe it is. I mean, check out this obvious example of racial discrimination. Look, the darker skin tones of concealer are under lock and key. Obviously, the only answer or rationale for which such a situation might come to exist is an act of active hate, right? Well, in the case of racists and loss prevention, CVS certainly isn't alone there. In January of 2018, Walmart also came under fire for similar issues of supposedly placing beauty products aimed at African Americans behind glass cases and locked doors. With a lawsuit filed by Esne Grundy and her lawyer, who else but the famed ambulance chaser and discrimination napkin Gloria Alred. Grundy claims in her lawsuit that she was attempting to buy a comb that cost 48 cents. But as far as I can tell, and correct me if I'm wrong, please do actually, this is the video that was either recorded by Grundy or by somebody else at the same Walmart location, and even if it's not, if it's anything like this, it's an aisle of expensive hair products all under lock and key. You know, just like razors and whitening strips and other things commonly stolen because drug and healthcare products, as I mentioned, are those products most commonly stolen according to the National Retail Federation Security Service survey data. I am here at the friendly, supposedly friendly Walmart at your local pair store. And as you can see, I have a worker here that's supposed to be helping me unlock the African American hair products. As you can see, they're all locked up all the way down. Even the hair dye is locked up. But you come around the corner, you come around the corner, and guess what? None of, none of the Caucasian products are locked up at all. This is racial profiling at its best. Followed by women's clothing. Not surprisingly there. It's not like the items are priced differently, I should point out. 
I mean, this picture may look pretty amusing at the outset, but it's not like the product aimed at black people here costs more, as the pink tax idiots would have you believe. When you get right down to it, that's all loss prevention is about, trying to normalize the playing field to, you know, reduce loss. These items get locked up because they are the most commonly stolen items, hence why the powder in this image was missing in protest, obviously. No, 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 they stole it! That's why it has a lock on it! The point is, some customers are just shitty. They lie, they cheat, they steal. Viva la raza! For example, Grundy's lawsuit against Walmart comes about two and a half years after the state of California changed their legislation to require a theft of over $950 in inventory before a shoplifter could be charged with a felony crime under Proposition 47. Astoundingly, since this ordinance passed, retailers, including CVS, as well as others such as Target and Rite Aid in the state, have reported an increase of at least 15% in shoplifting. Well, imagine my shock. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes should be the freaking state motto of California at this point now, shouldn't it? Yes, California, you know, become is a, is a mess. You know, it's like coming from Europe, I already saw this movie before. So, you know... But they're not alone in that either. As of June 2018, almost 2,000 Lowe's locations have ceased checking receipts of exiting customers because a black man in Philly accused the company of racially profiling him because while he was in a store in freaking West Philadelphia, he was asked, as is everyone everywhere else, to produce his receipt. You tell me I gotta give you a receipt, but I've already paid for it. Oh, man. Oh. Yeah, this young lady right here right. tried to give me to give me, uh, her a receipt. Okay. What policy do you have that requires me to give a receipt to a person at the door after I've already paid for it? Nani? Why so mad? Sounds to me like either you stole something or you just wanted to be a shithead. Which you certainly seem to want to be, because uh, after denouncing the company's actions as mere lip service, he went on to demand a private meeting with the CEO. Do you understand the lasting effects of this though, friends? It's the boy who cried wolf predicament. Now we have no freaking clue what claims are real and what are false, because every opportunist wants a piece of this pie. But let me tell you something overall. They're not loyal customers, they're vultures. For example, here's a man saying Old Navy employees harassed him for wearing one of their jackets into a store. Maybe that happened. I mean, I've actually been nervous about that happening to me before. Or then there's this girl saying she was forced to strip to prove she hadn't stolen a bikini. Maybe that happened, although I kinda doubt it. Maybe that's me just seeing too much shit like this to buy it anymore. But then you have guys like this. This city councilman who is holding public protests to cry about racism from Best Buy when nothing actually happened to him, beyond again being asked as he left the store if he had a receipt, if he had purchased anything, as happens at every Best Buy, where no police reports were filed, where the company apologized to him anyway and yet he's still out there complaining and essentially called one of the store's black managers an Uncle Tom for supporting him. Or this guy, who was asked to leave a Target and said he would not leave until an employee admitted to racially profiling him. Then he uses that quote as proof that he was racially profiled. It's kind of ridiculous. It's hurtful, man. I work hard. I make my money. That's cool. I don't need to be profiled, man. You wasn't doing that, but yeah. You were doing that. So. So you admit it. Yeah. Just be honest. Yeah, well, I mean, if you're going to leave. If I say, yeah, I did it, then, yeah. So I you did. admit it, man? Yeah, sure. You raised your profile, man? Sure. Thank you, man. Yeah. Target, man. That's ridiculous. He just admitted on camera. You raised your profile, man. One target. My whole story, man. That's crazy. How are companies supposed to respond to this constant screaming racism card? Well, Sierra Heiser Williams and Tot 2010 examined the long term effects of customers to news about racially loaded scandals affiliated with various brands or companies. 
and the impact of those perceptions on brand image and the influence that marketing potentially does to mitigate damage to brand image. Specifically, this study examined reactions to consumer racial profiling, or CRP, an acronym I'm going to use intentionally for the rest of the description of this study, just for a friend. Anyway, the emphasis on CRP was directly on shoplifting in this instance. So perfect for our analysis here today, right? But this is a very fascinating study to me for a number of other reasons. Let's start with this one. While the language frequently refers to the experimental condition in the study being representative of exposure to marketing, to, you know, assuage the public of fears of a company being racist, I would say it is, in practice, anything but. And while I might attribute that to the study's age, it's really not that ancient, so I don't think we can. What I mean by all that is this. Participants were all shown an NBC Dateline segment, which depicted racial profiling across three different brand stores. And the clips, by the way, all participants agreed, did in fact show racially motivated profiling. Regardless of whether or not it was true, they agreed. Half of the participants were then just asked questions about their perceptions of the brand alongside questions about their personal morality, but the experimental group was first given a pamphlet which described, according to the researchers, crime statistic data and information on the struggles of retailers coping with shoplifting. Um, so yeah, the so-called marketing condition was really a red-pilling condition when you think about it. Maybe just a little? As it certainly did have an effect, but maybe not in the way you might anticipate. Immediate responses of exposure to CRP were more negative in the control condition than in the what I'll call red-pill condition. That is, participants felt more positively about brand images when they had been provided information about U.S. crime statistics and struggles with shoplifting, with a reduced correlation of attitude change from R equals 0.79 in the control to R equals 0.39 in the experimental condition. Oh boy, I'm so excited I actually get to recreate the findings of this study in a few moments, but, but hang on now. This is a longitudinal analysis, so were the findings trend persistent? Interestingly, no, with the correlations then returning to 0.79 and 0.82 respectively. As I've kind of been saying, it seems that outrage is fleeting, and there's no reason to care about customers who merely patronize your business rather than, you know, patronize it. Shit, homophones are confusing sometimes, aren't they? Rococo, you slimy blackmailer! How did you get in here? You don't have a key? No, only half a key. What? I had to split it with a sound effects man. Uh -huh. After a month, all businesses' images had begun to regress towards more positive perceptions. And while this return to normalcy was seemingly more rapid in the red pill marketing condition, it rose in every case, except one, in one brand, Polo. What makes that more interesting, though, to me is that the researchers concluded from these data that they indicate marketing has a potential positive impact on dampening the negative effects of brand image after the CRP, and that might be supported by the data if any company ever in the history of the last freaking 30 years of market research had ever once responded to such a racially motivated event in a media vacuum, by the way, by disseminating national larceny data. Certainly, Firing long-term employees, restructuring your entire organization, making massive public apologies in self-flagellation, and generally acting bitch-made, that's how companies tend to respond to these kinds of incidences that we've seen in the last couple years. And that could not be further removed from the manipulation that the experiment conducted here in its attempt to simulate the PR cleanup effect. This would be like if, in response to Papa John dropping an N-bomb, Papa John's as a corporation started giving out free copies of The Bell Curve. But even if it was representative of typical marketing, the long-term effects still are at best a bit more of an expedient return to form, or occasionally even increase perceptions regardless, which is the weirdest thing here. 
And actually, hang on, I know this is going to be really long, but what is going on with Polo here? I can't ignore this. Why did image perception of businesses drop when given information on crime statistics, but then increase over time when they were not given information about crime statistics only when it concerned Ralph Lauren? In fact, the opposite happened. People liked Ralph Lauren Polo more when they were not given crime statistics. I tried to get consumer demographic data on the other two companies and Ralph Lauren, but they were all sketchy, so instead I just looked up a few SWOT analyses that's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats assessments. Here's what I found. Banana Republic, which is owned by The Gap, has a slogan of accessible luxury. It's aimed at adult professionals. Eddie Bauer's slogan is the original outdoor outfitter, and they pride themselves in the durability and quality of their products. But Ralph Lauren Polo is pretty much strictly a luxury product aimed at the upper class. While all of these are marketed to the more affluent, Ralph Lauren represents a unique financial status symbol in the mainstream. Particularly, it did among 90s era hip hop artists as a signal of, as they say, having mad stacks. Maybe the crowd of people with a more neutral view of Polo in the outset didn't react so positively to that crime data because it contradicted or conflicted with something about the brand being associated with hip hop yet came to respect the brand more when they weren't exposed to said statistics? I, I don't know. It's just a weird finding that goes contrary to the rest of the data, and I'm always looking for a potential explanation, even if it's not a very good one. Because while everything else regressed to the initial mean, opinions in this control condition significantly increased for Polo. Anyway, the reason I bring all that up is ultimately because of crime statistics themselves. And despite any secret meaning behind the idiosyncrasies concerning Ralph Lauren, they're fairly straightforward, so let's not beat around the bush. Perhaps you should let George know that as Carlton, I'm in a position to scratch his bush if he'll scratch mine, capiche? <laughs> Hello? Oh. Here's the hard facts. African Americans represent about 12% of the total United States population, yet commit a disproportionate amount of crime. And while I've highlighted a few different types of robbery or theft here in the FBI's 2016 statistical data, specifically relating to today's topics, we are looking at larceny, which includes shoplifting, at 27.7%, and forgery or fraud, which would include the use of crappy coupons or attempts to scam a business at 31.9% and 30.5% respectively. The fact is that the CVS Loss Prevention guy, who those four employees tried to sue over being racist, he was factually not incorrect in aggregate. It doesn't mean he wasn't also potentially racist, it just means he wasn't wrong. Now, I would be remiss to not include this potentially conflictory data, and as such, let's take a look at Blanco et al. 2014, which expands upon the condensed variable of larceny and isolates shoplifting specifically. And they found that white people were actually more likely to have shoplifted at one time than African Americans, although all races paled in pale face comparison to the red man, who was apparently the most adept at reclaiming his land in the form of stealing from the oppressive retailer. Warren, she seems to have made it her job. Who, Pocahontas? <laughs> Pocahontas, well, no, she's, look, look, she is, she is it's very offensive. offensive. You tell me, oh, oh, really? oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, Pocahontas, is so that what you said? I bring this up, though, not only because, again, duh, we should be looking at everything, including conflicting information, but also because the research suggests that antisocial behavior and psychiatric issues are more strongly correlated specifically with shoplifting than the race of the perpetrator, including drug and alcohol abuse. Again, looking at your engines. Shit, sorry about that, guys. Keep in mind, though, the FBI data is based on criminal charges. While this Blanco study, that's based on self-reported shoplifting behavior. So, when it comes specifically to shoplifting, the ratios actually may not indicate that black people engage in more of the behavior or engage in it more frequently than those of other races, although the general FBI statistics concerning robbery and larceny remain. Keep both in mind, though, as both do have potential bearing here. We know that complaints about racism can have significant effects on how businesses operate, often to their detriment based on fear of the dreaded label of discrimination. However, being discriminating is not inherently bad, and is in fact often based on, you know, reality. 
Dabney, Hollinger, and Dugan in 2004 wanted to get a better idea of who actually steals. And again, of particular interest to us, they assessed larceny in a drugstore chain, and did so by having trained observers view CCTV footage to identify very strictly defined signs of theft. Their data more closely aligned with the general FBI statistics than they did with Blanco et al.'s finding that African Americans who comprised 36% of the sample population of their observational analysis appeared to have committed 48% of the identified thefts, making black customers 1.3 times as likely to steal than white customers, and Hispanic customers 1.8 times as likely as whites. What I find so fascinating about this study is actually not the study itself. It more or less goes along with what we expect. It falls somewhere in between the data sets we've already seen. What I find really interesting, though, is the follow-up study, which is Dabney, Dugan, Topali, and Hollinger 2006, who were apparently so concerned with the assessment that their trained coders found Black people and Hispanic people more likely to commit crimes, that they wanted to see if they could then take those coders and essentially re-educate them into not observing more threats from minority populations. I'm actually not fucking joking, I'm, I'm serious, guys. It's an odd paper in a number of ways, but particularly in that if you look closely, you can see the exact moment where their hearts break and realize that they can't so easily train people to ignore reality. I mean, obviously we can do that, but not so easily. They did, in fact, manage to reduce the number of perceived threats by Black and Hispanic customers in their coders, though but only after inducing very stringent criteria, additional stringent criteria for suspecting theft, with uh, more warning signs indicated. They gave more specific instructions to avoid racial profiling, and they gave these coders a non-random sample of video footage to more accurately depict the population demographics in terms of statistical breakdowns. Yeah, and despite that level of effort to force observers to not observe, this forwarded a difference in tendency to select minorities as suspicious of theft from 0.61 in those untrained to 0.42 in those trained. So, in short, yes, you can train people to ignore reality, to not notice shoplifting. And given the fact that we've seen trends of less and less apprehension of shoplifters, maybe because people are afraid of being called racist? Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? The problem is it doesn't change reality. Reality is still a thing, and that means you will have shitty customers that will lie and cheat and steal their way into anything. And to pretend that there are no behavioral trends, there are no general statistical averages because it offends our sensibilities, that's ultimately bad for business. Machiavellian opportunists will always try to play you, and racism is just one potential trump card. But in the same vein, and going all the way back to the Shellrolf article, he also notes that some customers, yeah, are just bad, and will ultimately be detrimental to the company that is obvious from the aforementioned case of people like Camellia Hudson. This is a person who wants to cause a scene, who wants free shit, who wants gibbs. They're not a loyal CVS customer. Thus, was it a financially smart move for CVS to fire two experienced managers for following their own damn company policy of not accepting certain types of coupons? Well, you would think CVS actually would be more concerned, given that coupon fraud has been an issue for the company before. As in 2017, for example, two women in Ohio were arrested for theft of over $12,000 in products from various CVS stores in the area. And with many of those coupons being accepted by employees, despite being obviously counterfeit. And, well, given that not accepting fraudulent coupons and attempting to mitigate said theft apparently is grounds for termination as racist, guess what happens to CVS employees who don't follow the company policy on accepting fake coupons? Well, they get fired too. And fined. Last year, a CVS supervisor was fired for accepting bad coupons and giving discounts to customers, which cost the location she worked at around three grand, and then said former supervisor another three grand in restitution she owed the company in court costs. Sure, sounds like CVS is a great company to work for. Real damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of setup there. In contrast, you have 
Organizations like, as mentioned in the Gerov article, Danish IT company Service Gruppen, which openly and proudly state their willingness to essentially fire a bad customer and to terminate contracts with those who abuse their employees or make outrageous demands of them. In other words, some customers and their requests are ultimately just bad, and as such, it's better for businesses to terminate that relationship than to maintain it long term, instead focusing on the relationship between the employer and the employee. As mentioned above, when employees fear termination or even damnation in the case of Mastin and CVS for doing their jobs, how can a company expect exceptional customer service from either those too afraid or too disenfranchised to put forth any effort? Hal Rosenbluth, former CEO of Rosenbluth International, now owned by American Express, noted the importance of happy employees on ultimately ensuring happy customers, which we will see empirical evidence for in the next part of this series. Happy employees have more energy and tend to be in a better mood, while employees in organizations that dogmatically stick to the customer as king approach likely feel as though they are not valued. They are not owed respect, and that they have no avenue of recourse when they are mistreated. Following the rules gets you fired and labels you a racist. Not following the rules and giving customers breaks also gets you fired and it gets you fined to boot. Why would any CVS employee then be motivated to do anything above or beyond or below and beneath in such an environment of fear? Finally, and the note upon which I want to end this video, and the question that I kind of asked at the outset, again, is the customer always right? As we've seen extensively, no, they are not. The customer is very often wrong, and while not always intentionally malicious in their actions, the outcome is often the same regardless. Obviously, the customer is often right, particularly when they are actually your customer. After all, look at the struggling state of the comics industry as the companies that are involved in it bend over backwards to appease people who do not fundamentally buy comic books and then go on to publicly lament the success of projects from individuals that consumers actually want to read. Why do you think Cyberfrog and Jawbreakers performed so well getting public funding? It's because consumers want to read them. But in short, the emphasis of customer over all else is an outdated, outmoded concept if it ever had any place in the first place. But as we've seen, it's not supported by any of the anecdotal, philosophical, or ethical discussions I've presented here today, as well as some of the empirical evidence, nor from the experiences of successful business owners and CEOs that we've discussed. Still, it's up to you, viewer, to make that decision for yourself. Herb Keller, though, of Southwest, further suggested in his account of his tenure at the airline that the idea of the customer as always right was, quote, one of the biggest betrayals of employees a boss can possibly commit. This sentiment is similarly shared by Gordon Bethune of Continental, who in recalling a customer who was asked to remove supposed Nazi and KKK items of clothing while on a flight as it disturbed the flight crew, a story I am more willing to believe at face value considering it's now decades old and in the account of a CEO's transformation of a multi-million dollar airline from worst to first in the name of the book itself, you know, rather than a Reddit post that ends with the entire cabin standing up and clapping. We're not racist. With Bethune, though, asserting that, quote, some customers are just plain wrong. Ha, <laughs> plain, get it? And that, quote, business is better off without them. And I think that's today's basic takeaway. Sometimes you need to divorce yourself from your customers if they're either not really your customers or they are causing serious significant harm to your business. The customer is often wrong, but when they are wrong and we can quantify the cost and benefit analysis of just how wrong they are versus how much it would cost to capitulate to them, then we can definitely say it's not worth the capitulation. But we need more empirical data. And that's going to be the next part. We need to see the stats here. Is it worth it long time to fire an incredibly successful director who has made films that have topped the box office charts 
or to blacklist a comedian or dozens of comedians out of fear of bad public relations and press? What about the reverse? In the case of Sarah Jiang, is it right for the New York Times, at least for their business long term, to have hired CEO's transformation of a multi-million dollar airline from worst to first in the name of the book itself? You know, rather than a Reddit post that ends with the entire cabin standing up and clapping. We're not racist. With Bethune, though, asserting that, quote, some customers are just plain wrong. Ha, <laughs> plain, get it? And that, quote, business is better off without them. And I think that's today's basic takeaway. Sometimes you need to divorce yourself from your customers if they're either not really your customers or they are causing serious significant harm to your business. The customer is often wrong, but when they are wrong, and we can quantify the cost and benefit analysis of 